what it ends up coming down to as a coach, people like this, or just any natural body or for that matter, you're managing fatigue and you're managing emotions while going through that process. Because when you think about supply and demand, when you're powerlifting, you're usually well fed, unless you're trying to make a weight class because you do a little dieting. But if you're strategic, you're managing the fatigue, you're managing the demand, she'll perform really well leading into an event. But with bodybuilding, you get to some really extreme levels of body fat. Like, so your demand is really high, but you don't have the same supply. Hey everyone, if you like the Fitness Daily, just know that it's brought to you by Zor Fitness. At Zor Fitness, we offer coaching and individualized program design, as well as educational content for athletes and coaches. You can find it all in one place, zorfitness.com. Hey everyone, thank you for listening in to the Fitness Daily. Today I'll be talking to natural bodybuilder um, and coach Jeff Alberts. You've probably heard about him since he's been around the block for a while, and especially in the natural bodybuilding community and bodybuilding as a whole. Um, 3DMJ is uh, his coaching business, so I'll let him give his introduction because I know he has a lot of background and all that. So, Jeff, if you want to take the floor and just take it away with your background. Yeah, where do I start? So, I mean, I started lifting back in 1986 and haven't stopped since. So, I've been going at it for quite a while. Um, I'm a dad first and foremost and husband. And of course the natural bodybuilder comes out of me, but yeah, I've been coaching for 15 years, competing for 30. So yeah, there's a lot I can probably share. So I'll just let you just pick my brain and we'll go at it. Perfect. Uh, first thing I'm, I'm curious about, you mentioned you've done, you've done, you've been competing for 30 years. What was, when was your last competition? Last year I did WF worlds, um, okay. in November. Okay. So I'm still doing it on a high level. So I'm still top yeah. five in the open divisions, even at 52. That's wild. Yeah. So. And for, for those who are listening, um, I re- and if you don't follow Jeff, I recommend going to his Instagram and checking it out. He's pretty insane physique. Um, you could definitely tell he's put in a lot of years of doing this um, because you don't get a, a physique like that naturally and in just a few months of training bodybuilding or a few years that takes a, a while yeah. a while to build. Yeah. And, um, so you've been training, doing this bodybuilding thing for years on years. Um, when did you start coaching? It was 2010 when we first started 3d muscle journey. Okay. And back then when we first started, we said, Hey, let's just open this up to two athletes and give them a sponsorship. So yeah. we weren't getting paid, just get some experience. And then from there, it kind of just kept growing. It just kept growing and growing and growing organically. And here we are 15 years later. Um, yeah. But yeah, back when we first started, it was 2009. I was competing because I took like a two or three year layoff. And I was a little burned out at that point. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. But I changed perspective because prior to that, I was very competitive. It was either win or or nothing else. And I just got fizzled out because, you know, I didn't get my pro card at all and like, forget this. So long story short, I came back in 2009, different perspective, different mindset. Like, I'm just going to do this for fun. And it's about the journey. So that's why I named 3D Muscle Journey, 3D Muscle Journey, because it's more about the journey. And then, of course, having a different perspective with that competition season of just trying to have fun. It allowed me to open myself up when I was actually at the competitions because because of that competitiveness, it was almost like I don't want to talk to nobody because I'm here to win. I'm here for business. So just different perspective, different shift in mindset. I met the other coaches at 3D Muscle Journey and the rest is history. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah just... How many of you guys are there now? We have, there's five of us there's three of us that coach full-time there's uh myself alberto nunez um actually four of us um brad loomis and brian minor and then eric counts of course is you know one of the leading researchers out there yeah. he doesn't coach too much anymore but he's still like all the information he provides he's a great resource for us to keep better in ourselves and then of course we have a few people on the back end that kind of helps out as well so 
we started out as a, a four-man team, and then now we've been up to, I think, nine or 10 total as far as our total company. That's awesome. So <clears throat> I'm curious because I know you have Eric on the team who's big on the research side of things. How mm -hmm. has your training from both your experience and all your years of experience, all your years of coaching, and then you have resources that are in more of the research field, how has your coaching and training style changed from the beginning to now? Yeah. So my my training experience prior to meeting the other coaches, and I wasn't really into the science back then, because back then there was no internet, none of that. So right. I think my first introduction to a really regimented program was uh, Mike Mincer's hit. There was a guy at the gym who introduced me to it. So I got embedded in that camp for about 18 years. I ran a modified version of it. I didn't run it exactly like Mike Lancer said, because basically the training frequency, or the way he was kind of prescribing, I was like hitting like training once every four or five days, six days. I'm like, that's just way too long for me to be away from the gym. Mm -hmm. Like I'll go crazy if I'm not in the gym. I got to be in there at least three times per week. So I was training three days per week, low volume, high intensity, and it worked well. You know, I made some gains and it, it fueled me for 18 years. But then once I met the other guys, I was like, well, why don't you try some of these other things? You know, why don't you do a little more volume? Why don't you use rest and reserve and, you know, use these different types of tools. And because I was so ingrained in that first style of training for 18 years, you get a little dogmatic and you also get a little defensive because you, I can't, you, your identity is tied to that style of training. Like it's hardcore, you know, you're, you're going to failure on everything. So it's hard for me to bring walls down when they're kind of, it's like, hey, why don't you try these things? So eventually, you know, I came around, started listening a little more and started to slowly implement some of these ideas. And I'm like, hey, that actually worked pretty well, you know? Yeah. So it's like, eventually just the walls came down and I just learned since then, we're talking 15 years now, that you can use anything to your advantage if the context calls for it. So the mindset isn't black or white anymore. It's like, it's the shades of gray. Or in a sense, like having a big toolbox now. So I look at it now, like I got this huge toolbox. Hit training, just, that's just a tool. Let me tuck it away in the toolbox. Yeah. Let me, okay, high volume, that's a tool. Let me put that in there. And you can go with the diet, types of cardio, you know, like all these different types of modalities, like learn about them, experience them. And then you'll start to learn like what works, what doesn't work based on specific context yeah so that's kind of the style i coach now it's more like okay here's these shiny new objects that science is kind of saying like these might help us but i don't look at it as like the end all be all like i have to implement these things like let me experiment let me experiment with it see what it does and then okay when the context calls for it, i'll pull it out but nine times out of ten when i get on like when i meet up with a first time athlete you learn their life like if you're asking questions, you learn their life context. More times than not, like all these things you see on social media, it's like, you know, most of it you can't really implement. And yeah. it's removing white noise. That's what I do a lot of posts. I remove the noise because, you know, someone new to the field, whether it's, you know, bodybuilding or whatever, they're going to shiny new objects. Like, ooh, let me, let me jump on that. A month later, let me jump on that. So they never really go into any type of, good structure and good consistency and it comes down to like more of the principles so i just remove a lot of things get people centered get a good you know of course the program is based on scientific principles but it has to jive well with someone's life context yeah uh, I, I definitely like that a lot i think there's a lot of new information coming out and the research side of things, a lot of new techniques and um, different ways of training. I'm sure you've heard of the the big thing now is like long length partials and everyone's hopping on that and they have their own um, opinion on that. And just looking at it as like, uh, you have to look at the whole picture, right? And yeah. the consistency you mentioned is definitely one thing um, that I have found to be one of the biggest variables that needs to be nailed down. You got to figure out what your baseline is, like whatever you 
doing? What's <clears throat> what's the baseline? So like, let's say you, you're okay, I'm going to start doing these partials. Let's say, for example, on a specific movement, it hurts to be in that stretch position. There's a little bit of aches and pains. Like, it's not optimal if you have aches and pains because you're not going to perform that well. You're not going to yeah. be motivated to train either because of the pain. Okay, what if you stop short of that? Let's say you're training with two-thirds of the range of motion. It's more towards the top. Like, that's its own baseline. And from that baseline, what's the goal? It's the same as any other baseline you're working with is to elevate your performance, whether that's load, reps, sets, whatever it is, you're always trying to elevate baseline. And it's easier for me to kind of say these things because I'm like 38 years into training. And I know a lot of this stuff is just very, it's like minutia. So whether like, okay, maybe even if let's say we throw a percentage out there. So let's say 5%, you're going to get more gains if you're in this fully stretched position. But if your aches and pains, they're building up six months later, you might've gotten a nice jump for six months, but then here I am slowly starting to pass you by because I'm doing what I can do without any pain. There's no constraints in a sense. So even though I'm moving a little slower, eventually I get to where I want to go. And that's why at 52, 53 now, like I'm still training on a decently high level and still doing well on a, on a competitive side of things. Yeah. That's kind of how my brain just looks at things. Like I don't get too caught up in the weeds too much. And I don't, because of how I used to be in my early days of being really ingrained in a specific camp and defending specific camps. Like I'm like, now I'm on the outside looking in going like, okay, you guys are arguing over just little things when you guys could be taking both sides and really using it to your advantage. Yeah. Um, I, I know. Sorry if you hear my dog barking in the background. I've tried to mute it while you're talking. Yeah, so it's like not dogs. background. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mentioning the whole consistency thing and that you've seen a lot of people kind of uh, switch their training up a little bit too early because they see this new shiny object come up and they're like, I want to try that. Mm -hmm. Um what like what are some seeing a squirrel right exactly a squirrel, it's like, any <laughs> any moving object that walks by yep. he's going crazy um and that's how i find a lot of people are in general right um oh there's this new technique out oh there's this new piece of equipment i want to try that yep. oh I, I read about this i saw it on instagram um what are some like big pitfalls that you see when someone wants to build muscle. So they come to you and they're like, Hey, Jeff, uh, I really want to be a competitive bodybuilder. I've been struggling with X, Y, Z. And you start working with them for, let's say a few months. So you have a good basis of them as an athlete. What are some of the big pitfalls you see with that, with them? Lack typically? of patience. Lack, Lack of patience. patience. Yeah. Because I mean, everybody wants to be jacked in two months, three months, yeah. you know, yeah. or they're looking at everything on Instagram, <clears throat> which looks, it, it's interesting because I've been observing from afar as a lake because I haven't been posting as much lately. And almost every post I see, it's someone who's like really jacked or really elite, or even like on the natural bodybuilding side of things, people are just showing the winners per se, and not really showing like someone who maybe came in second to last or maybe fourth place. Like, so the way I look at it, there's levels to this. So when I go to my son's karate class, there's white belts, yellow belts, blue belts, red belts. He's a brown belt or no, he's actually red, black now. He's like maybe a little less than a year away from getting a black. We had to start a white belt. Yeah. So it's like when I get an athlete, I kind of have to assess where they at. Are they white belt or are they more closer to a black belt? So if they're a white belt, I have to coach them as if they're a white belt. I can't coach them as if they're a black belt. And that's what's frustrating sometimes as a coach. Sometimes people expect to be coached a certain way or they expect results to come at a certain time frame. But the reality is, is you're white, the next level is yellow, not black. So it's patience and there's a process to it. And that's how I coach. It just yeah. depends on where that athlete is. It's like, okay, from that, that point, that's how I'm going to start coaching. So it can be a two month, which two month process. It could be two years, it could be five years. It kind of just depends on where they're at. Yeah. Interesting. So when you coach someone, how do you assess where they're at? Like, what are the things that you're looking at? Cause I know with, um, let's say powerlifting, you can, you have a baseline pretty straight away of, you know, you see how they move when they do a squat bench deadlift and you know, their numbers, their one rep max and all that. Mm -hmm. And then CrossFit, we have a few um, baseline tests, right? Like, oh, 
how fast do you finish this standard workout? Uh, what's your max clean and jerk and all these other numbers for bodybuilding? Yeah. What are like baseline things that you look at? I mean, the first thing that stands out, right? is the physique. Yeah. yeah right? That's what probably where everybody's going to go. Like you got to assess the physique. But I've come across people who are just genetically gifted. They have amazing physiques. Like you see 20 year old with a physique of a 40 year old, but the mentality is not a 40 year old mentality. Sometimes it's a 20 year old mentality. The maturity level is not there. So you can't coach as if they're 40. It's like they still, because there's the physical has to grow, the mental and the emotional has to grow as well. So you have to take all those things into consideration. So it's not just like what's on surface level. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of people say, hey, this person's beginner, intermediate or advanced. When I look at an advanced body alert, it's like, yes, okay, the physique should look advanced, but also how they, their mentality, their maturity level, and actually their knowledge too. And, and how they're capable of like making in the moment decisions. Like if you're in the weight room, it's like, if something is hurting, do I just push through it or am I mature enough to back off and like, okay, let me just walk out of the gym today and I'll come back tomorrow when I'm, I'm a little bit more on point. So that to me is more advanced bodybuilding than you know, like what you look like. Yeah. And that's the yeah. stuff I do all the time. Like in my Instagram posts, it's just, I kind of talk about in a sense, like how I auto regulate things on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed that there's a, like on the captions, you're always, it's kind of like a little diary in a way. Uh, where you kind of talk about uh, how you're feeling and all that and how do you have to auto-regulate. So with that, because I know you mentioned um, reps and reserve, is mm -hmm. that one of the prescriptions that you like to give athletes on their program or do you use RPE percentages? It's fairly the same thing, just different yeah. terminology. Um, but I mean, if we look at the rep ranges, that's more like we look from a principal perspective. So we know we can create hypertrophy anywhere between five to 30 reps, thanks to the science, right? That's where yeah. we kind of look at those tools, like, okay, we're going to use this. But when you're on the lower end of the rep ranges, because the load is heavier, you don't have to be as close to failure. So you know, one to two in the tank, three in the tank, you're probably getting a stimulus. And then the higher rep ranges, you know, if you're 15 or above, it's like the load is so light. Half of that set, you're like, it just doesn't feel like I'm doing anything. It's not until you get to the end of the set where it's like, okay, this is hard. Then you have to make sure you're going to failure to ensure you're recruiting plenty of muscle fiber. So from that perspective, that's where I'm kind of looking at. So I'm not really like too focused on specific rep ranges and things like that. Like let's say you walked into the weight room and you had no prescription, like no one gave you a rep target. So instinctually, I think you're like, okay, if I need to get a stimulus, I'm going to make it hard. Yeah. You're going to push yourself as hard as you could. So I don't get myself too attached to numbers per se at this point. So if I know if I'm, let's say in that ballpark of eight to 12 reps, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get at least one in the tank, maybe two on uh, a failure on occasion. And usually with failure, maybe the last set only. So I don't, in a sense, like the first set, you're going to, if you go to failure, that's going to be harder to recover for the next set. So you might not get as much performance out of those sets. So that last set, I'm you know, pushing a little bit harder. Yeah. So with specific athletes, like if I know it's a, someone who's fairly new, chances are they don't really know how to gauge that too well. So I might tell them, say, I need eight to 10 reps here. And if it's a, if it's a safer exercise, I'm say on the last set, I want you to go to failure. And then I'll actually have them record it so I can see if they're actually going to failure or not. But it gets them closer to knowing how to gauge those reps of reserve because they're actually testing themselves. Or if I said, hey, I want you to do eight to 10 reps, but I want you to do lead three in the tank. It's almost like, what's three in the tank? Like even me training 38 years, sometimes I don't have a hard time knowing what three in the tank is or four. Yeah. One or two, it's a little bit easier. Failure, that's that's a lot easier. So I'm just here going, going for broke. Yeah, for sure. And so do you find that difficult with people who kind of push themselves a little bit too much? Right. Because there's people who either don't push themselves enough. Very few are pretty good. And then there's the opposite end where wreck people themselves. push themselves. Yeah. Wreck yeah. themselves. If you're not in a, if you don't dig yourself in a hole, you didn't do it right. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. That type of mentality. Do you, how do you manage those type of people? It's usually the lower volume. Lower volume. Yeah. It's one. Because yeah. it's hard to tell people don't 
go to failure as often. Yeah. Because there's like my like that was me with hit. My mentality is like, I gotta go hard or I go home. So if someone told me I need you to do two in the tank, I'm like, yeah, that ain't happening. But if someone told me, hey, <laughs> you're gonna go from three sets down to two, that's okay. But I still get to train hard. Okay, okay, I think I could I can that's a good compromise. Okay. And when I prescribe deloads, that's nine times out of ten, that's how I'm gonna do people's deloads. Because as bodybuilders, most bodybuilders, they want to get after it. So if you tell them for a the whole week, I want you to leave, you know, four in the tank. I want you to lower your loads down. It's like most people are going to go, why am I even here? <laughs> this is boring. Like, yeah. I'll just rather just take a whole week off and do this. Right. So usually like I'll do is like, okay, if they're, let's say they're doing their baselines, three sets and exercise, take it down to two. Still train hard, still train as if you're trying to progress, but just do two sets only. Okay. So if you're, you know, if you're, let's say your typical workout is 20, 21 sets in a session. Well, now you're doing maybe 14. That's a big drop off in volume. So the demand goes down. So in theory, anyways, you should be able to recover better from that. And right. we'll get the goal accomplished as far as bringing down the fatigue levels with that dealer. Yeah. It's just mentally more engaged with that. Yeah. Even going from two sets to one, if you still get to just go at it. And what happens is, your focus because it's not here anymore it's here so you're the demand quite possibly could even go up higher because now you're you're pushing yourself even harder because you know you only have two sets instead of three i've seen that happen too interesting yeah i like that approach um just because i think the standard deload most people do is like you you go in and it feels like you're doing nothing not um, like you're doing warm up sets. Exactly. Like, and if it's me, I'm like, you know what? Uh, instead of, I'm just going to take the whole week off, or I'm, I'm just going to go in twice this week and just train hard and I'll have yeah. five rest days. Yeah. I'm the same way. Like it kind of bothers me. Like I'm just like, what is, I just feel like I wasted my time. I could have just done something a little bit more productive. I'd rather go watch a movie than do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that approach though. Um, right. Cause any little change, you take a set, if they're going to failure, you take, from two to three, like you said, within the whole session, like that go that brings volume down pretty big. Yeah. Um, so keeps you more mentally engaged because you get to push yourself. You get yeah. to say, "Oh, I did eight reps. So I can now see if I can do nine. You still get to yeah. do those things, but you're just not doing as much full work. Yeah. Um, do you work with anyone who's kind of a? I know the new term now is hybrid. Right. But do you work with anyone uh, who does catch uh, fire, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 interesting. Um, but do you work with anyone who's like into bodybuilding, but they're doing also something else, whether that's cycling or some other activity that kind of mm -hmm. has an interference with bodybuilding? Yeah, I prepped one guy last year, the year before. Um, <laughs> he wanted to do a bodybuilding show, but at the same time, like triathlons, power lift, like all this stuff. I'm like I don't think I'm capable of like, because I've never done it before. So I'm not going to say, yeah, I'm going to take you and just, we're going to do all these things at once. Cause I didn't have, I don't have enough experience with that. So I said, Hey, if you want to do the bodybuilding thing, prep. And then after that, you transition to those things. I'm good with it. So he was okay with that. Okay. But yeah, I just don't have enough knowledge to like, I'll work with people who do like, maybe some, you know, jujitsu. They're doing that two or three times a week. It's more recreation type stuff. Like I know how to manage the supply and demand, but we're talking about high level competition stuff. I'm just not that type of coach. Like my expertise is natural bodybuilding. Yeah. So I kind of stay in my lane. So if someone came to me and said, Hey, I want to do these two things at once on a high level. I'm like, that's not my, that's not going to be me. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I've had plenty of like, I've had like jujitsu. I've had people have done, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, mixed martial arts competitive fighting and that type of thing so i have worked with athletes doing hybrid stuff like that but not like mm -hmm. hey i'm getting you ready for a fight and we're gonna make sure you're making the weight and all this it's like no that's not my yeah not my area of expertise yeah and so i know before we started um started this conversation i mentioned to you that i did bodybuilding a few years ago um and i competed in nbc NPC, sorry. Uh, mm. NPC, I did three shows. Um, I didn't do, I was going to do the OCB show. Um, but by the time it came around, I was pretty worn out. 
Um, I think I was in prep for too long. Like I was very lean and for a little too long. I didn't do, uh, I didn't take a good break in between. Instead, I just kept like grinding. Mm -hmm. Um, so as a natural bodybuilder, and let's say someone who does, uh, has a long competitive season, let's say they have a show one, uh, like, let's say in April, and then they have another one, like in August. So there's this big gap. How do you approach that from a training perspective and a nutrition perspective? Because obviously staying that lean for that long is mm -hmm. not fun. I have an athlete right now. We're getting ready for Worlds, and he competed in July, got his pro card, wants to do Worlds. a long gap going from July all yeah. the way to November. So once we finished that show in July, it was pretty much diet. We actually gained two kilos back. So like five or six pounds we gained that back and then we had a holding pattern for about two months and then the last stretch we're like okay now we're going to get back into you know the deficit and get you back down and grind for worlds so it's it's i've done that stretch from july to november i did that in 2019 it was a very long stretch and the mistake i made is doing shows the whole time it wasn't planned though like i had a show in july I'm like oh there's a show in three weeks i'll do that one like and i'm already like, oh, ready there's for another it. one here another one. so i just i did yeah i just kept going and i did pretty well up until september to the fade out like my you can tell my physique started to look flat tired so i was just too much so long so you year I'm going to say, okay, we're going to try to find shows that are within a two or three month window. Because if you're staying as an experience, this when you're lean for a long period of time, it's really rough. Yeah. Physically, it's demanding. Mentally, it's demanding. Emotionally, it's demanding. And not just on us, but the people who are around us wives, husbands. Like, man, this, you, just, you haven't gone out with us for like six months. So it's just, it's just really, it's a tough, it's really a tough ask to go that long. Yeah. Yeah, for and, sure. I'm, and I tell you this, the athlete that's going to worlds now, like, okay, you're two or three year off season now. You need a break. You need to recover. Cause it's not just July to November. Cause it's, you know, we started dieting in, in the early part of the year. So it's almost a full year of being like in this process. Yeah. It's, it's a long stretch. It's a long stretch. And um, I just remember like, yeah, you, like, cause I started my first show in April and I started the November leading up to that. So I started like around Thanksgiving. So mm -hmm. Thanksgiving, you know, I That's tried to, yeah, okay, now we're yep. exactly. And then from then on, like, you know, Christmas, like missing out, like on, I tried to stay on track in Christmas and all those holidays, New Year's, and then all that missing out time with eating out with family and friends, like you were mentioning. Um, it definitely takes a toll for sure. And I think um, like most competitive sports, right, there's like the stressors that come along with it. Bodybuilding's an interesting one. And I think a natural bodybuilding, especially because you have to fine tune a lot of variables. Um, so when just for background, like I did bodybuilding and then I transitioned a little bit into like powerlifting and CrossFit. Um, definitely, I think I had a mentality too where I was like, oh, I got to stay lean because like mm -hmm. I had still had that bodybuilding mentality going into there. And that was like the aesthetics. Yeah, yeah exactly. So that was very difficult. Um, do you find that a lot with people coming? Maybe, maybe either have the opposite problem or have like uh, the aesthetics part of it, if they're coming from like powerlifting or another sport and they want to do bodybuilding, um, like, do you find that the mentality of bodybuilding kind of gets to them at all if they're training? If they're inexperienced with bodybuilding, what I get people coming from powerlifting is oftentimes it's because of injuries. Like they just can't keep up with the powerlifting. So it's like, oh, let me do bodybuilding. Yeah. And they go to bodybuilding and they realize, oh, I got to start dieting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do this competition. Okay, now I'm changing my lifestyle big time. And that can be kind of a shock when you're, you know, if, if you're eating a lot of food for performance and now all of a sudden your food gets slashed, you're like, now I got to try to maintain performance with less food. Yeah. 
Like there's a huge demand with that. And what it ends up coming down to as a coach, people like this, or just any natural bodybuilder for that matter, you're managing fatigue and you're managing emotions while going through that process. Because when you think about supply and demand, when you're powerlifting, you're usually well fed, unless you're trying to make a weight class because you do a little dieting. But if you're strategic, you're managing the fatigue, you're managing the demand, you should be able to perform really well leading into an event. But with bodybuilding, you get to some really extreme levels of body fat, like just really low. So your demand is really high, but you don't have the same supply. So how do you keep performance up? How do you keep the recovery up? And it comes down to just, again, managing, managing like the timeline. Because the yeah. more time you give yourself, the least invasive the process is going to be. And that's that's a concept some people have a hard time dealing with. Like, what do you mean I'm going to diet for six months? They hear six months or they hear nine months. They think, oh, that's six months, nine months of agony. But if you're removing the same body weight in, let's say, four months, that four months is going to be a lot more like hell than the six to nine months of going more conservatively. So it's really organizing the timeline. That's what's really key. And it's making sure like people, you give them the, like what to expect. Someone's never gone through the process. You have to kind of lay it all out. Okay, this is, this is probably what's going to feel like in the beginning. This is what it's going to be like in the middle. This is probably what it's going to be like towards the end. And now we got to think about when you come out of it, it's probably be even harder coming out of it than actually dieting. Yeah. Because you're used to a certain look now. Like you're sure. And life has been this way for sometimes a year. Now all of a sudden you don't know what normal is anymore. So once the show's over with, it's like you're eating more food, but yet you're gaining all this weight. It's hard to deal with that mentally. You see your body all of a sudden kind of go the opposite direction. So that there could be a struggle coming out of it more for people than actually doing it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I heard. I, I remember was your hearing that. About it? Was yeah. your experience coming out of it? It was very much that, right? Like, I is like oh man like you're so lean for a period i know i was lean like i mentioned i was a little bit too lean for too long um so it was kind of like scary towards the end like oh crap like no no, no i want to keep eating a certain way i want to keep training this way i want to keep my cardio was high at that point um the weeks leading into my last show and i wanted to keep all of that like you know but cool, it, right you're like this yeah looks cool <laughs> yeah like, I look like great. don't feel my, great sometimes yeah. but it looks great felt like trash but my, you know I was so vascular and stuff I was like this is awesome like mm -hmm. um so it definitely took a while but I was lucky that I had like I had a good support system like my sister my spouse and all that so um eventually like it, it, it was an easier transition because I had that um yeah. versus like if I was living on my own and all that I probably would have grinded a little bit too long and I don't mm -hmm. know where that would have led led to yeah because sometimes people they they come in out of it you probably heard of reverse dieting yeah. But it's just like, I don't know, when you're like that depleted out and then it's like, oh, okay, this week I get to eat 100 extra calories and you have no more hyper-focused goal there to keep you locked in. Mm -hmm. It's easy to kind of just like, you end up seeing a lot of binging and type, that type of thing. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it, it can be pretty rough. That's why usually when the show is over with, it's like, okay, I need you to go out and have a good time with your family, eat some food do that for a day or two and then let's get back to some structure and it's like okay we're just going to eat x amount of calories higher than where you were may try to maintain the same type of habits and if you, if we are doing a lot of activity let's cut that at least in half yeah because you need recovery at that point if we're talking six percent body fat seven percent five percent sometimes people go lower than that like you need a, you need recovery like you need food you need some rest and you know, shiny new object syndrome, right? We come off a show yeah. like, oh, I want to try that new training program. And you try to double down your volume and all this. And it's like, you're still in a, not a great place. Like you're still in a very deprived state. So you're better off like, yeah, let's take a week off of training maybe, or hey, just go in there and just, just move some weight around and let's make sure you're eating to recover. And part of the recovery is not just your body, but mentally and emotionally. And also the people, again, the people around you, like, they want to take you out to eat, like let, let them, doesn't yeah. mean you have to go crazy, but let them enjoy you again, because obviously you've lived a different lifestyle for a year. Yeah. And it's like, you're talking through this, right. And it's all like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Huh? But when someone's in that mindset and let's say they don't have a coach, it, none of that makes sense. It's very much like, no, no, I want to, no. I want to keep, keep this. It going. sounds rational. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. It's like, it's like my son. I can tell him to I'm blue in the face. Don't do that. He Yeah. does it anyway. But once he does, he's like, oh, okay, now <laughs> I know what he was talking about. right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I definitely think, um, especially in bodybuilding, like coaches are essential for sure. Keep They you in help, check. you know, I Yeah. know sometimes they, we get bashed a little bit. Like, why do you need, why do you need a coach? People don't need coaches. It's like, well, you look at any other sports out there in football, there's a head coach, you got offensive coordinators, Yeah. defensive co like all these people that is trying to help make you a better athlete. Mm Yeah, exactly. Give you that different perspective and expertise. -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, are you someone, I know you post a lot of videos of your training and you have a home gym, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So um, do you prefer like for yourself or for your athletes to do more machines or free weights? Like what's your, what do you gravitate more towards? Both, whatever, Both. whatever doesn't hurt. Yeah. It's like if it feels comp. So when it comes to exercise selection, whether it's machines, barbells, dumbbells, whatever, I look at it as okay. Of course, what muscle am I trying to target? That's a given. Let me make sure that exercise hits that mind muscle connection, meaning like I can groove that really well. I actually feel what I want to feel. Is it safe? Is it comfortable? And do I enjoy doing it? And if all those check out, it's a good exercise, regardless of what anybody else says. Yeah. So you might tell me, Hey, Jeff, this exercise is the most optimal exercise. I'm like, maybe. So, so oftentimes when people are like consuming content. You know, if someone's being very concrete, coming across concrete, it's like maybe that is an optimal exercise. You know, if if all the criteria I just mentioned for myself checks out, if it doesn't, if one of those variables is off, then I'm going to find something else that I can really groove on. Yeah. That's Yeah. how you're going to, that's like, in a sense, that's to be more practical and it's leading to more sustainability. Yeah. And it's hard for someone who's new because they don't really have any concepts of like what feels good. What, so you have to be, you have to absorb it. And then again, explore. And that, people are so afraid to explore because everybody wants the answer. Well, everyone wants someone to tell them the answer up front. It's the questions I always get. Give me the answer. Like Yeah. no one gave me the answer when I started out because we didn't have the internet. I had to actually go through some trial and error. Some things worked well. Some things didn't work well. Eventually you start evolving. And you start to develop critical thinking skills for yourself because you are being open-minded, because you are exploring, you get to see what works and doesn't work. So when I coach, I coach from that philosophy. I might say, okay, we're going to try this movement, but I want your feedback. So like when I watch a form video, it's not just me watching a form video. It's me listening to what they tell me, what they're, they're feeling while doing it. So it might look great. Their form might look solid, but they might be feeling something completely different. So I have to look at all those variables and, and try to help them figure out what works well for them. And eventually what ends up happening over time is, thanks for your help, Jeff, I got this. Because now I know how to implement things and to assess it and then make changes. And you'll evolve. Like uh, the way I train now, you know, 52 is much different than 53, much different than when I was 23. I can get away with a lot more stuff because my body is a lot more pliable back then. Yeah. But it's now not so much. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's, um, You won't see me squatting 400 pounds anymore. right. Yeah. <laughs> My lower back's be like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think it's funny that you mentioned like, you know, some people want some concrete answers and I get that a lot with some of the athletes that I work with where they're, they'll ask like, Hey, is this right? And like, I look at them squat, it looks right. And then, but my first question is, does it feel good? Like you squat, like in my eyes, it looks right. It may look a little different than the person next to you because they're built differently, like different limb lengths and all that, but does it feel good? Mm -hmm. And they're Yeah. like, Yeah. It could yeah. be the opposite too. You look at someone's scar, you're like, oh, that looks, yeah. Yeah. And they're like, Yeah. that feels awesome. Feels great. Yeah. And then at that That's point, kind I'm of like, when you look at like the analogy I like to use, like NBA basketball, right? Like you you watch uh Steph Curry shoot a free throw, flawless technique, right? You look at like Rick Barry, I don't know if probably Rick Barry is probably, probably dating this, but he used to shoot granny style. This guy from the 70s and 80s shoot granny style underhand. They had almost identical free throw percentages. So you look at Rick Barry, you're like, man, that just looks totally off. It looks so wrong, but yeah yet it's so right because it grooves again, like 
safe and comfortable mind muscle yeah. connection like all those things i mentioned it's like everything's yeah. checking off the list yeah exactly that's funny i uh, have to that's look why it's important like you said you got to ask like how does it feel? yeah yeah what are you experiencing with that any pain or hey let's let's try to move your hands in an inch or, what does that feel like does it feel any better so you kind of just go back and forth i do that all the time too like sometimes it's not so much like exercise selection. It could be like how I execute the movement while it's happening. It's like a car in a sense. Like, you know, you're always kind of like throttling, you know, you've got traffic in front of you. You're going a little faster. You, you let off the gas a little slower, apply the brakes. You feel the road, you know, let me avoid this, this little speed bump or something. It's the same thing when I'm training. Like if I'm doing, let's say a flat press and you know my shoulder's hurting a little bit, I might just shift my elbow in just slightly. Yeah. Then the pain goes away. So I'm doing those things all the time in the moment, but it's hard to really talk and share about those things on Instagram. You know, it's like, yeah, otherwise your caption is going to be like 3000 words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a question about kind of how you approach uh, the programming side of it and the dieting side of it. So I know with, um, with like strength and conditioning, one of the biggest things they always talk about is periodization. Usually people, and this, they do it a lot with like people who are in uh, like field sports or something like that, where they go through an accumulation phase, a strength phase, an explosive phase, right? Like they go through this whole periodization program. And I'm curious with bodybuilding, like I personally, like when I did bodybuilding, I didn't, I didn't do anything like that. It was always accumulation, mm -hmm. always progressive overload. So I'm curious, is that mm -hmm. how you, how do you approach that programming side? And then now that I think about it, like for nutrition, do you take a periodization approach slightly? Do you on have like blocks side, of time? It's on the training side. Hypertrophy is pretty forgiving. Yeah. And, and the way I still get it too, is from a practical standpoint, like real life perspective. I don't know what I'm going to be doing four weeks from now. Yeah, sure. I might have to take my kids somewhere three days out of the week. I can't train five days a week. I might only be able to train twice. So oftentimes I'm not the way I program. I don't like, okay, I'm setting up six months in advance and periodizing it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to set up maybe a block four to seven weeks worth of training. And then within that, there might need to be some changes based on context. But I think of it just think of it from a from a from a week standpoint. Like, okay, how many days can a person train? Here's the questions I would ask. Like, this is what I ask my athletes, first time athletes. How many days a week can you train where it's gonna work with your life schedule? So when you're in the gym, you're not stressing on the things you gotta do outside. Mm -hmm. So that way when you're training, you're locked in. You're not thinking about, oh, I gotta hurry up and get out of here because I gotta go take my kids to school or I got to get out of here because my wife's going to be mad because I'm in here for two hours. So it's like, how many days a week can you train and how long can you train per session? Is it an hour? Is it two hours? Is it 45 minutes? Based on that, then I know how much work they can actually handle with good quality where they have high efficiency. And then from there, okay, okay now I know, okay, how many days? Okay, now I know, okay, here's where science comes in. I got to hit each body part two or three times a week. Most cases can be twice for most people, sometimes once, depending on context. So I'm like, okay, how am I going to organize this depending on how many days they're training? And then from there, I'm looking at, okay, exercise selection. Because obviously a squat is more demanding than a leg press. So it's like, okay, what, like, okay, what's your, your top three quad exercises? So let's say I get a three top three that they can really groove on. What's the demand of those exercises? Hey, what's the hinging patterns? What's our pressing patterns? And it's like, okay, now I think about the demand of those movements. Now I'm going to organize it across the week where I'm not grouping a bunch of hard things all in one session. I'm spreading the wealth out in a sense. So that way I'm managing the fatigue as best as I can. Because keep in mind, especially for competitive bodybuilders or dieting for shows, like I got to make sure that they're recovering well, performing and recovering well. That's how yeah. I kind of look at programming. I don't look at it as like, oh, I got to, like, I need an accumulation phase. I need this. It's like, no, I'm trying to manage their performance and mm -hmm. their fatigue. And as bodybuilders, I think 
as a whole, we do a very poor job at managing supply and demand because most bodybuilders always want to do more, hmm. do more, do more, do more. But we look at other sports, look at baseball, basketball, football, like all these other sports, it's all about performance. In order to perform, they know they need recovery. So they do a yeah. pretty good job at managing that, whereas bodybuilders always more, 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 more. Yeah. So from, so like nowadays, I hardly ever look at bodybuilding to learn more about my bodybuilding. I look at other sports because they got better stranglehold on those things. So I take those principles from there and I apply it over here. It's a yeah. hard sell. It's a very hard sell because you have a lot of content creators. They push certain concepts. It's very black or white. But it's, mm -hmm. it's for me, I kind of just, again, I just look outside of the world of bodybuilding. You can learn so much more. Yeah. And so there's, you've learned a lot about, let's say, looking at other sports regarding recovery in order to perform and fatigue management. What other things have you picked up from those? The mental outside? side of it too. Yeah. Like tennis. I watch a lot of tennis. Uh, it, I don't know if you watch tennis or if you know how that goes. Like you get into a five set you know, five set match and, you know, you're in the last game of the five set tie break. Mm -hmm. Like the mentality, you have to make sure that you're keeping your composure. It's like the end of a set, right? Like if you're grinding on the last rep or two, do you lose your form? Do you break form? Do you lose stability because you're just not keeping yourself composed? Mm -hmm. So those are the things I take away from the mental side is like watching how these elite level athletes perform in the toughest points of yeah. a game, a match, or whatever the case may be. Like, what are they doing to make sure they're keeping their performance really high? Look at Tom Brady. He's got yeah. blitzing linebackers coming from all different, but he's so cool in the pocket. He'll just slide to the left, throws a laser laser pass. Yeah. He's not, like, getting all, like, crazy. So whether you're dieting for a show and it's, like, you're super hungry and tired, like, how do you react to that? Do you get yeah. let yourself get razz razzled? and get yourself all stressed out even more, or do you take a big deep breath and go, okay, yeah, it does suck, but it could be a lot worse. Yeah. So how am I going to react to this? So yeah. Those are things. Yeah. I think that's what separates a lot of people, like a lot of high level competitive natural bodybuilders on the world level. Because mm -hmm. it's like at that point, it's more like, okay, who's getting the leanest? Who can get yeah. themselves really lean? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a game of suffer for sure. It is. Yeah. yeah. Oftentimes like, well, what protocol are you running? It's like, you no, know, how long can you persevere? Yeah. Yeah. And on average, I'm curious, like from your experience, how, how long do people last at that competitive high level? Um, as far like, as long, longevity? You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I know you've been, in, I think you're an anomaly where you've been in for so long, typically There's how long? There's a few of us. Like right now, I, have you ever heard of Marshall Johnson? No. So Google Marshall Johnson where you get a chance. And yeah. he is 10 years my senior. Okay. And he's still one of the best natural bodybuilders out there. Like he just competed at the OCB, what is it, Yorton Cup. I think he's second there. Okay. He's beating guys half his age. And he's 63 or four now. Really? Yeah. He's still a Korean on a super high level. And, you know, Kent Beerley is another guy. He's like in over 60 years old, still competing like, you know, Mr. America, Yorton Cup, all yeah. these high level shows and doing exceptionally well. And I think it's like, obviously at our age, it's a disadvantage. I think physically it's, it, it's just naturally gets harder to keep yeah. training, but Mentally, though, because of the experience level, the maturity level, it's actually an advantage. I always mm -hmm. wish, like, the, if I had, a, like, one thing I could wish for as far as bodybuilding, give me back my 30-year-old body with, with my brain now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd be crushing it. Yeah. It'd be optimal. Yep. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, I'll look up uh, Marshall Johnson. I'm curious to see how he looks like and um, learn more a little bit about him. Um. Yeah, th I, there was one more question I wanted to ask. Um, I'm curious, like, kind of going back to, we mentioned in the beginning of the show where there's all this new research and all that, and you've mentioned, like, hey, it just adds tools to the toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, what is something that you've learned 
like through your experience and not through research that you think a lot of people are missing in their journey of building more muscle? Mm, that's a good question. I think, I think just the experience side, you kind of just learn not to focus so much on minutia. Because when you, I mean, I'm sure any field you're starting out in, you're trying to make sure everything is right. You're trying to be Yeah. perfect with everything. So you're focusing on these little small details that in the end probably don't matter as much as maybe we think. And then eventually, as you continue to go, you're like, it's more about the big rocks. It's more about practicality because we're, we're human. We have real lives. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, there's not too many bodybuilders that, hey, I'm making a ton of money off of these shows. Like, this is my, my total income. <laughs> so most of us have nine to five jobs. Yeah. So it's more about like the big rocks and just finding what works well within your life context. Again, like I mentioned earlier, it's removing all that white noise. getting rid of the squirrels in a sense, like, Yeah. okay, I'm going to just focus on myself, create a nice structure for myself that fits really well and keep, keep data be your own science experiment. Cause if Yeah. you keep track of your own data and if you're very consistent with what you do, it's easier to, to identify what works well and what doesn't, what works well, keep it, what doesn't change it out for something else, but only, only change one variable at a time, maybe two at most. Because feel I got a lot of noise going on at the same time. It's like, what's doing what? Yeah. So, and that's that's the main reason why I'm still going at at this point. It's just in a sense I've kind of learned myself really well, and I keep things fairly simple. yeah i think i i really like that and I, i've said this multiple times i'm sure like anyone who's listening they've heard me say it but i always say like i'm a very what they say boring programmer I was going to say, I'm a boring body. I'm like a very yeah <laughs> boring bodybuilder. You go on my Instagram, I'm like, go back 10, because I've been on there for 10, 11 years now. It's like, it's the same posts. It's like, it's the same boring stuff. But, but then you always get the questions like, how are you so jacked at 53? Yeah. <laughs> and that's It's what because it is. I Yeah. focus on the boring, basic stuff. I got the principles down. I got the foundation down. There's consistency, there's effort, commitment, all those, you know, those things that are very cliche, but so Yeah. true. Yeah. And um It's not the shiny I toys. It's like the, the length, the length and partials isn't what, what created me, you know? right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I think everyone always wants like an answer that's kind of a little bit more flashy. And they always want a program that's flashy. And it's like, you probably won't get it from me. Um, but you know, with consistency and all that, we'll get to wherever you need Yeah. to go. One one of the things I say a lot, I'm sure it probably irritates people. I say a bar when I first started a barbell curl in 1986 is still a barbell curl in 2023. Yeah, exactly. Maybe I do a cable curl, maybe I do a dumbbell curl. It's the same movement pattern though. Yeah. Uh, what's the, the phrase? One of my coworkers told me it when I first started working with them, it was, um, marry the move. Don't marry the exercise, marry the movement. Yeah, it's a good Something thing. like that. Yeah. So it's like, you know, um, looking at it like that, some people think there's like you were mentioning before that one exercise, that's like the Holy grail. That's going to make you the best bodybuilding builder ever, or best athlete of whatever sport. And it's like, it's usually the movement that you're focusing on and checking Yeah. off those three boxes that you mentioned. Yeah. And another thing I think about too is like if I ever feel like I'm not doing enough. Then I always ask, okay, what creates atrophy? I'm like, no training at all. How long does that need to happen for? Eh, like three to five weeks. So even if I go from four days a week down to two, if there's still enough effort there, muscle isn't going to go anywhere. Yeah. Or even go, or even miss an entire week of training. Like, Yeah. you're not going to lose muscle. You might get a little detrained, come back, you're a little sore, what have you. But true muscle loss, it takes a lot for that to happen. So that gives Yeah. me peace of mind. Whenever I feel like I'm not doing enough, like I just go back to that question, like, yeah, fine. Yeah. I think that's a really good one to emphasize. Mm Yeah. -hmm. I use that on almost every day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. That's all. That's funny. No, that's a really, that's a really good one. I think to emphasize people think it falls off, like muscles are just falling off the body 
after one day of not training or a week or of not, deload. Or you're not progressing as fast. Yeah. But it, like, again, it's easy for me with 38 years of experience. You look back and, okay, yeah, I, was, I didn't need to be worried about missing a workout or two. Yeah. But when you're very eager and motivated to make gains, like missing a workout can seem like the end of the world. Yeah. When really you think about it, it's like it's a dr small drop in, in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, Jeff. Thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. Um, I've been, I, like I said, I've been following you forever. Um, and I've gotten a lot of things, like I've learned a lot from, um, content that you post and with 3DMJ and your own personal page. So if someone has questions or if they want to give you a follow on Instagram or anything, um, where can they contact you? Uh, 3DMJ underscore Godfather on Instagram. Probably the best way to do it. Yes. The Godfather. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jeff, thank you so much. I appreciate you and your time. You're and, welcome. Uh, thank you.